just want to cheer. Okay, good evening everyone. This is a meeting of the finance subcommittee on March 20, March 23rd. I don't think we did anything. Um, Mr. Mr. Clerk, could you please call the roll? Chairman Elliott? Here. Counsel Counts Conway? Here. Counsel New? Here. Three present. Three present, so uh, this is, um, uh, this meeting is being held for a number of reasons. First, uh, a couple of motions that were sent um, from previous city council meetings. Uh, we're going to go through the financial forecast review. This was a study that was done uh, in concert with the Colin, uh, Edward J. Collins Center for Public Management. Um, this was a grant funded uh, study that was done to aid and assist in the financial forecasting of the city, which clearly is imperative in order for us to present a balanced budget, um, to look at our revenues, to provide a stable, uh, more stable um, um, financial process in the city. So without any further ado, um, there's also discussion about, uh, there's another motion forwarded relative to uh, the charter schools and the cost and the impact on the budget. So uh, more of an update, we've we committed to meeting on a regular basis and we are holding ourselves to that um, you know, to, to that commitment. And so with that, um, with us tonight, um, I see is the Chief Financial Officer, Connor Baldwin, and uh, the Deputy Financial Officer, um, Allison, ooh, I coached her, so I'm gonna know her maiden name, but Chambers, Chambers okay. <laughs> I'm gonna go with Chambers. Okay, so with that, um, Mr. Baldwin, do you want, uh, members of the subcommittee, any questions? I know Council Conway is with us, assuming. Uh, Council Noon or Council Conway? I'm all set. Okay, let's, okay, let's go. Um, Mr. Baldwin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're really excited and, and thankful for the opportunity to make this presentation to the subcommittee this evening. Uh, the finance department has been at work with the, uh, the Collins Center for the last several months, uh, funded through a grant from the Governor's Community Compact Program uh, to fine tune our five year financial forecast. We, f we feel that this is uh, timely to bring before the finance subcommittee and, and subsequently the council as we enter into budget season for FY 2022. Uh, we have some of our make the presentation. Um, Mr. Clerk, are they? Okay. Uh, I, I think it's uh, Ms. Con Cannon who, who'll be starting the presentation. Sure, just one moment here. Okay, I think everybody should be seeing my screen. Yeah. So as Connor said, we're here from the Collins Center to provide a report out on the work we've been doing around the financial forecast review for the city. And uh, my name is Sarah Con Cannon, and I wanted to take the opportunity first to thank Connor and, uh, and Allison and others in the city who brought us on and uh, allowed us the privilege to work with you all. Um, I'm gonna introduce the Collins Center for those of you who are not familiar with us. We were created by the state legislature in 2008 to provide consulting services and technical assistance to cities and towns and school districts and state agencies in the Commonwealth. Um, and we do a broad range of work uh, from financial management projects, HR projects, uh, municipal operations projects, but financial management is one of our um, uh, largest practice areas. And as Connor said, this work was funded through the Commonwealth Community Compact Best Practices Grant and the team included not only 
me, but two of my uh, wonderful colleagues, Tony Teresi and Rick Kingsley. And before we jump into the substance of this evening, I'll ask each of them to introduce themselves. Tony, you want to go first? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony Teresi. Uh, I have been with the Collins Center since uh, my retirement from local government in 2011. Uh, prior to that, I had over uh, over 40 years of uh, local government experience um, in both finance and uh, in town and uh, management. I was uh, in the town of Danvers uh, for a number of years, uh, the city of Worcester, uh, and uh, I uh, spent 32 years in the town of Danvers as their as their finance director. Uh, my focus with the Collins Center uh, has been on a number of uh, financial best practice programs. Um, financial forecasting is one, but we also do capital improvement programming, uh, financial policies, uh, and uh, 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 kind of any other uh, uh, finance issue that may arise in the course of a local government's uh, uh, budget needs and finance. Thank you. And I'm Rick Kingsley. I worked for 30 years at the State Division of Local Services where I headed up their municipal consulting operation, the distribution of local aid and the municipal data bank. I've been with the Collins Center for almost six years now, believe it or not. And uh, so I, I won't talk any more about myself because I've got a lot of content to cover that's equally boring so, <laughs> so <laughs> that's I'll, not true <laughs> i'll hand it off to sarah and now uh, we'll get started thanks rick uh and just by way of introduction on uh for me i have worked for the Collins center for the past nine years i work on a variety of consulting projects and currently uh, lead the finance team and so um as tony said i do a lot of capital uh planning and, and budgeting work so we're going to get into the project scope next. Um, and so we worked with Connor and Allison to sort of define a scope of work that would be most beneficial to the city at this point in time. Um, and so our first task was to review the existing forecast model. And Tony's going to go into uh, some of our findings. And in particular, we wanted to do a deep dive into the major local receipts categories. Um, mainly because the pandemic was putting a lot of pressure on that revenue stream. So we, t we started to compare some local receipts and how local receipts are budgeted um, to other cities in Massachusetts. And we were modeling various scenarios for local and state revenues throughout the uh, past you know, nine months and trying to incorporate the best information we had um, throughout the pandemic. And uh, another topic that we tackled was to look at how the forecast tool um, modeled Chapter 70 aid and charter school aid and assessments. And that's where Rick is going to give you some uh, really deep and interesting, I think, information. Um, and then finally, um, our task was to present our findings and our final report. And so today we are doing our preliminary presentation to you all. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tony to talk about our review of your existing, the city's existing forecast model. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Sarah. Uh, wanted to uh, to emphasize that you know this presentation is is uh, meant to hit kind of the highlights. Uh, at the end of this uh, this process, we will be issuing a, a more detailed report that will, will be provided to the uh, city administration. Um, so I don't intend on getting into uh, uh, all of the details that will be in the report, but uh, rather uh, uh, kind of comment in general about the structure that we saw uh, and, uh, and how well it works for the city. So I, I first wanted to mention that uh, the, the city's budget document is actually an extremely good uh, resource uh, both for uh, elected and uh, appointed and, and, uh, and city residents. Uh, the uh, finance staff does a, a, a really excellent job in, in presenting uh, a significant amount of detail uh, in a section in the budget that's 
devoted to uh, uh, projections, both revenue and expenditure projections. Um, uh, and so that, that's a, that's a val valuable tool, understanding that that's kind of a snapshot in time. So the date that comes out, numbers are, are constantly changing. That's the benefit of having uh, a, a good tool uh, uh, um, to use as you're developing uh, uh, finance uh, projections for the community. So the basic structure of, of your forecast model, I'm sure it's not it's nothing that you know that uh, you're not all aware of. It, uh, it uses historic data uh, significantly and uh, makes allowance for uh, any current trend. Um, that that's an important feature uh, since uh, so much of our cost in local government are uh, uh, labor driven and, and contract driven. Uh, using historic data tends to give a pretty good representation. Um, I believe the city uses a five-year average uh, for that. And then as, as individual things happen, uh, that particular forecast number would be changed in the model. So the second thing I mentioned, uh, I'll mention the report in more detail, is that the tool that the city uses is extremely uh, comprehensive and very robust. Uh, in presenting the uh, uh, multi-year budget, uh, the actual tool itself uh, goes out more than more than five years, and and uh, um, and obviously, uh, as as uh, I mentioned, the amounts uh, change. That forecast is revised. Uh, the, the the other uh, uh, benefit of of using the five-year average is it's a good kind of a good check on the use of reasonable assumptions on revenues and expenditures. In other words, uh, uh, unlike a, a perhaps an intuitive sense of what might be happening in the upcoming year, the revenue and expenditures are driven by what has occurred in the past. And it's not what has occurred from a budgetary perspective, it is what has occurred from an actual perspective, which is a, is a, a very good, uh, a piece of uh, information uh, that is used to develop the budget. We found those assumptions uh, very reasonable. Now, as I mentioned, the, uh, the projection, uh, we typically, in our studies for the Collins Center, use a five-year projection, but the finance office has a projection model that extends uh, significantly out into the future. I think everybody recognizes that, you know, the further you go out with assumptions, the less the less accuracy you will you will have, um, uh, and that's true for 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 any any forecast uh, model that you would do in in the finance area. But the the key is, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a very robust tool, and the, the next point is that regular updates needed. Uh, so the the finance office uh, periodically. Uh, uh, updates the the forecast model. Uh, in practice, the forecast model would be updated uh, right up until the tax rate is set. So, if the budget's released in uh, in in April, there may be a forecast model that's early in January, revised as things progress through the state legislature uh, uh, and through the local knowledge, and and right up until the tax rate set, which is could be in, in November when uh, you have uh, the uh, complete information both on revenues, expenditures, and uh, your assessed value. Key, a key feature um, in, in some revenue forecasts, uh, revenue expenditure forecasts we see is that um, the capital improvement program has been somewhat of, a f of an afterthought. Uh, the, the, uh, the capital improvement program is typically is a five-year program. Uh, low may run it longer, but it it uh, it does have impacts on a forecast, and the city uh, is is making use of that and should uh, continue to make use of how the capital improvement program impacts your expenditures, whether it be debt service uh, for a new large construction project or uh, what we call pays you go projects that are funded by current taxes or, uh, or free cash. 
And the, the, the final item um, that we hope to, to uh, be able to help with is the development of a user's guide, the continuity. Uh, and the benefit of that is although the employment is stable, it's, it's uh, a complicated tool. So it's good to have the background on how the, on how, uh, the person working with this tool would, would use it and then also pass it on to their their the next official that might be uh, responsible for developing the the forecast. Our right, next Sarah, could you have that? Okay. So I mentioned the the, the forecast model is very is, is very detailed. Um, the current forecast model is Excel based, and as you can see from the slide, there are uh, many, many different worksheets that, that feed in, into the model. Uh, in our report, we'll go into a little bit more detail on the worksheets, um, but because the worksheet is so detailed, uh, uh, we feel that it, it, it picks up many of the areas. I should mention one of the areas I left off here by mistake, <laughs> There is also a very critical item in the forecast. It's a, uh, a payroll personnel projection. As I mentioned earlier, payroll costs are you know, one of the, the leading costs in, in municipal government. And the finance staff has done a good job, including in this, uh, in this model, a worksheet that takes uh, personnel costs and factors in both potential labor settlements and um, uh, uh, step increases. There are many contracts you have. Uh, uh, some may have ranges, some have steps given out to employees over an incremental number of years. Uh, this model allows uh, uh, both uh, uh, looking at current and then running iterations on what might the impact be on different uh, wage settlements. Um, the model has, has one set of assumptions uh, which is uh, uh, reasonable, but certainly it, it allows for, for ongoing uh, use as, as things go on. So I won't, as I mentioned, I won't, I'm not gonna go into the details of the model uh, in this slide, uh, but needless to say, the, the worksheets that back all of this up are very detailed, uh, do a good job both of tracking historical data and projecting data uh, into the future. So as Sarah mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, uh, one of the most variable uh, features we saw for Lowell and that the finance administration was very interested in looking into was the, the question, of not just chapter 78, which is the general aid that comes to the city of Lowell for schools, but also the charter school reimbursements and the charter school assessments. And I'm very happy to pass that on to my colleague who is, uh, I would say one of the experts in, in, in this field and has taken the time to really uh, get into the, uh, the details of, of this system that can be very var variable and is, is also tied into certain assumptions and trends. Rick? Sure, thank you, Tony. Um, I'd like to start by introducing a couple of uh, terms that probably many of you are familiar with, but I think it'll help the discussion as we go. Um, you probably know, you probably he have heard the term foundation budget. Um, that was uh, a term coined by the Education Reform Act of 1993, so a long time ago. Um, and the foundation budget is supposed to represent a minimum amount that should be spent to educate pupils uh, in a particular community to provide an adequate education. So it's the minimum amount to provide an adequate education. And the foundation budget it changes based on enrollment changes. Uh, it's also um, influenced by the demographics of the pupils that attend. Uh, whether they be English language learners or low-income pupils, uh, vocational pupils, what grade level they are, uh, all those things make a difference in the foundation budget. Uh, the rates are increased each year by inflation, and they're adjusted for differences in regional wages. 
Um, but, you know, I think a lot of folks felt that uh, the, the rates were not high enough and that initiated a lot of discussion in what's called the Student Opportunity Act that passed in, I believe, November of 2019. And that act significantly increased um, several of the components of the foundation budget, employee benefits and fixed costs, because everybody knows just increasing, increasing health insurance by inflation uh, is probably not enough. Um, guidance and psychological services were increased, uh, sped out of dis district tuition, uh, was increased slightly. That's an assumed percentage. So <clears throat> it's not based on your actual pupils. Um, English language learners are based on your actual number of English language learners, and that went up slightly. But the biggest one that impacted Lowell was the increase in low income increments. So for every kid that's low income, right now they add about uh, $4,800 per pupil. Um, but that is, is slated to increase uh, to close to $8,000 over seven years. So that's, that's a, that, that will be quite helpful in Lowell, I believe. So the foundation budget is met by a combination of a local contribution, which comes from city funds, plus the state chapter 78. Uh, and the local contribution is, con is uh, calculated based on an aggregate wealth model, which includes Includes your property values and your income. And, and it applies the same percentage for each community across the state. So if your income and property values are on the low side, you're expected to contribute less. And if you're a Weston, for example, and your uh, values are through the roof and your income is through the roof, uh, you're expected to contribute quite a bit. So, so that kind of introduces the topic and uh, I'll, I'll start focusing on the charter stuff now and there's a significant amount of overlap. Um, these, are the, these are the number of pupils uh, that attended uh, charter schools from Lowell, but this is actually FY22 data. Unfortunately, uh, that was a typo. Um, so you can see that there's about, uh, there's quite a, there's over 2,000 pupils there, 2,146. Uh, however, um, what's interesting here is they attend primarily four major charter schools, collegiate, community, innovation, and Middlesex. Uh, you can see collegiate has over 1,000 kids expected uh, in FY22. Uh, these, these numbers are based on an enrollment, pre-enrollment report submitted by the charter a couple of months ago, you know, in, in December. So uh, that, that's, th those are the number of pupils that they expect. Uh, of course, that data changes as we get closer to that point. Um, you know, when you get to October 1 and you have those actual enrollments, uh, they revise all the data. So this data is, is fairly fluid throughout the course of the year. Um, but I think, and this, uh, just going back to the other slide for a second, this data all comes from a DESE uh, report called the tuition rate summary. And you do a filter on the data by the sending community. So you get all the, all the um, charter schools attended by low pupils. Um, so now moving on to the next slide here. So calculating charter assessments involves a couple of things. We, uh, we look very closely at the cap uh, for each charter, the enrollment cap. That's stated in their charter so that they, they can't really go above that cap. And if they do, you don't have to pay for any pupils above the cap. Um, so some, char some charters call for the school to add grades over time. And that was the case with the collegiate charter school. They added uh, a grade in F, they plan to add another grade in FY22 and another one in FY23. So there'll be a full K to 12 um, school. And that, that increases their enrollment cap by 88 pupils each of those two years. Um, Community charter school was a few kids over their cap of 800. They requested uh, through the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education to increase their cap to 815 pupils, and that uh, request was granted. 
So, you know, the good news is that the, the enrollments at these charters are somewhat finite um, in terms of their caps. Um, and I know the, the increase in the charter tuitions has been a big issue in Lowell and uh, is cause for, for concern. Um, so the assessment, so the assessment is pretty simple in terms of the basic calculation. You take the number of pupils from Lowell at each charter and you multiply it by the tuition rate. And the tuition rate is a function of a foundation budget for all those kids. So the 113 kids that are supposed to attend uh, collegiate next year, uh, they develop a foundation budget just like they did for the low pupils in FY22. And so uh, the demographics of those particular kids will impact the foundation budget and the tuition rate for that charter. So let's, let's go to the next slide. So, you know, this is, um, so as, I, as I've said, the, the foundation budget would be the same for these pupils as if, if they stayed in the Lowell system. So, so that's, uh, so essentially what this does is it takes those kids out of the Lowell, you know, they're still included in the total city foundation budget, but to derive the tuition rate, they do a separate calculation of the tuition of the foundation budget for those low kids attending collegiate um, or community or Middlesex or innovation. So, um, and if the sending districts, so many districts spend quite a bit above foundation, uh, they, the Department of Ed factors up the tuition rate if a community spends well above foundation. Lowell does not spend a significant amount above foundation, so it does not really impact the charter tuition rates. So let's go to the next slide. So as I alluded to earlier, that the Student Opportunity Act uh, sets out some very large increases for low-income uh, enrollment. Uh, the act establishes 12 groups low income groups and Lowell is in the group that has 70 to 79.99 percent low income enrollment. I think Lowell is just a hair above 70 uh, in that calculation. So this will increase the low income low income increment in the city's foundation budget from a 4,681 to about 8,000 over seven years. So that's a significant increase, uh, millions and millions of dollars in the Lowell uh, City Foundation budget. So that's the good news. The bad news is it also increases the tuition rates you pay to you will pay to your charter schools. So, so the the issue with the low income enrollment, um, you know, it, it was it was. Um, it's been increased to 185% of the federal poverty level um, based on the Student Opportunity Act. Uh, it had been 133% between FY17 and FY21. Um, and, and so uh, the, the Student Opportunity Act uh, basically asked DESE to determine the best way to measure low income enrollment at the new 185% percent poverty level. And what Desi came up with was essentially, uh, well, let's take the higher of the number of students matched through direct certification with the higher threshold, or the district's 2016 percent of low-income pupils multiplied by its current enrollment, which is, is the um, factor that was used for the city of Lowell. So that decision benefited Lowell. So if you switch to the next slide, Sarah. Um, so there's a few other miscellaneous factors that impact this formula. Um, and, and one of them is if you have a, a pupil that is homeschooled or attends a private school but lives in Lowell and enrolls in a charter school, well, those kids aren't counted in the city's foundation budget, right? So it's not really fair to charge the city for those kids. 
in the first year. Um, so the state pays for those kids in the first year they enter a charter. Uh, but then in the next year, they get added to the city's foundation budget. And then the city be, uh, is assessed for those kids in year two. Um, the other issue is, and I think I alluded to this with respect to community, um, is that if, if a charter enrolls more kids than their cap, uh, the sending communities are not assessed for those kids. So, so that's an, an important point. So uh, charter reimbursements. These are, are, this is a pretty complicated process and I'll show you a little spreadsheet about this um, in, a, in a minute that uh, hopefully will make it uh, fairly clear to you. Um, so this, the Student Opportunity Act changed the uh, state reimbursement formula to reimburse 100% of the current year assessment increase 60% of the prior year and 40% of the increase from two years prior. Uh, it replaces an old formula that, that reimbursed 100% of the first year, 25% of the second year, 25% of the third year, 25% of the fourth year, and 25% of the fifth year. So it all adds up to 200% if you add it all together. So it's, it's not substantially changed, but it, uh, really front ends the reimbursement. So um, rather than waiting for it over six years. Um, so the appropriation for this uh, reimbursement has been underfunded in the last several years. Uh, and the Student Opportunity Act calls for full funding of this by FY23. Uh, of course, that's that's been delayed uh, a year uh, until FY24. So the forecast assumes that the state is successful in reaching full funding by FY24. The, the reimbursement also fully reimburses for the $938 per pupil facilities assessment that is a component of each tuition rate. So for some reason, the state um, assesses sending communities the 938, but then fully reimburses it. Um, as part of your reimbursement. So that gets funded first. So the facilities reimbursement has always been reimbursed fully. Um, it, it's just that the state has not gotten, uh, uh, right now the state is reimbursing the full 100% of the first year increase, but it is only partially able to fund some of the second year increase and, and none of the third. So that's where it stands right now. So I just wanted to give you a little look at some of the um, numbers here. Um, so you can see collegiate, um, if you look at their total enrollment, you can see that their cap is growing um, by the 88 pupils I mentioned in FY 22 and 23, but then it's, it, you know, it caps out at 1200 kids. Um, we basically assume that about the same number of kids from Lowell continue to attend this school, which is, you know, 91, 92%. Um, and the tuition rate reflects the tuition rate in the governor's budget. Um, so, and, you know, that is a, that again, a tuition rate is largely um, a factor of what's going on with low income enrollment. Um, collegiate has a, has a, you know, fairly substantial um, component of low income enrollment but not compared to um, low community. Um, there's low community has, has essentially got about six out of seven of their pupils are low enrollment, I mean, low income. And that number has increased markedly in FY22. Um, so, so I just wanna give you a, a quick, um, overview of this, um, this spreadsheet. So, and as you scroll, can you scroll to the next slide, Sarah? So this is how the transition and facilities reimbursements work. This pulls the total projected charter assessment, nets out the facilities aid to get the, um, the transition aid increase. So the transition aid is what they run through that 160-40 formula. 
So I do that to calculate a total entitlement. And then I um, estimate how much the state will fund with full funding reached by 2024 as per the Student Opportunity Act. So that's a quick overview of that. This allows the user to set the percentage um, increase for funding uh, in that shaded blue area uh, in the you know, third segment down as you, as you move down. Um, so let's go to the next slide, if you will, Sarah. So finally, this is, this is the projection of chapter 70. Um, you can see in 22, the city lost a total of 305 pupils, and that impacted your foundation budget in a downward way by 4.3 million. So that's quite a, quite a decrease, um, largely pandemic-based, I'm sure. Um, so the assumption here was that those kids would come back over two years. Um, that could be tweaked easily. You could make, you know, you could assume 250 would come back in the first year uh, and only 50 the second year, let's say. Um, but that's, th this is just a, just to look at it. It can be adjusted uh, fairly easily. Um, so, so the way this works, um, Unfortunately, our pictures are kind of blocking the, um, there's a percentage change there for the foundation budget, and I think it's 4.3, um, and then the required local contribution grows at 4.25. Um, that's consistent with historical growth. Um, so, and the chapter 78 is a function of foundation budget, less required contribution equals chapter 78. So um, the good news is the city will be getting fairly robust chapter 70. The bad news is you'll be paying uh, some more of it out to the charters. So that, that's it for me. Um, I'd like to turn it back to Tony, I think. Seth. Thank you. What, as I mentioned, one of our tasks uh, was to, uh, Look at how this how the city uh, uh, is faring on uh, local revenue. That's sort of the uh, you know, revenue that you collect on many, many, many different types of uh, functions. Here, it kind of preprint uh, uh, the first two months of uh, fiscal twenty, and then your actual collections the first two months of this year. So, in other words, it was uh, 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 the Spreadsheet shows the budget of 20. Uh, it has the second column shows how much was collected from July 1st uh, um, uh, 19, uh, 2019 to December, uh, the end of December 2019, percent of budget collected. The next section looks at your budget this year for those, for those items. Again, looks at the collections for the same period. This period would be July uh, 20 through December 20. Uh, and as, as you can see, in general, you know, the city's on track. You have 38% of budget collected. Uh, uh, you were 38% in, in the first half of fiscal 20, and you have 39% in 21. Uh, but what are, the, what are the, the signs that, you know, that we recommend you watch for? Uh, uh, one would be uh, the meals tax. And you notice a drop of over 100,000 in the meals in the meals tax. Notice a big drop in hotel motel excise tax from 180,000 to 25,000. Uh, the uh, the other item to watch carefully is uh, uh, inspection building permits. How did the economy affect um, the collection of, of permits for building activity? On the other hand, some of your revenues are up. So in general. Bottom line, you're you're kind of on track, which is good news. Uh, the flip side of that is uh, to watch carefully the trends in the categories that I mentioned. Now, as as part of this project, uh, we also uh, were requested to look at well, what happened with local city local revenues in the last major um, economic downturn, which was uh, it was in uh, uh, fiscal. Uh, 2008, and it ran through 2011. So there were downturns in revenue, and we looked at uh, the nine cities in Massachusetts that had at least the same population or greater than uh, than Lowell. We did not include Boston in that. Uh, 
And there was a downturn, but it took about two or th three years for that for the revenues to reach uh, the level they were uh, kind of pre-economic downturn, which would have been in fiscal uh, 2008. Um, it's a certainly certainly different type of economic impact, uh, but it was uh, we requested a look at that, and uh, I should say nothing startling jumped out at us during that period, except kind of a general overall trend that it took about two years to, to gain back the loss that we had. Uh, the, the last slide is uh, just looking at uh, state aid and assessments comparison. Um, Lowell receives a significant amount of money from the state. Rick talked about chapter 70 and school tuition reimbursement, uh, but there are a number of other categories. Uh, the good news for Lowell is uh, in the 22 governor's budget, um, Lowell, uh, at least uh, allocated in the governor's budget, still has to go through the legislative process. But there's an increase of uh, uh, 13, approximately $13 million. The assessment side, that's the money that Lowell has to pay. It's actually it's considered an expenditure. Uh, and that is also going up. As Rick mentioned, um, although Chapter 78 goes up, the charter school sending tuition is also going up. That's an assessment, and you can see that increase. Nonetheless, the net amount to the city, that's taking the uh, state aid amount, the total from state aid, uh, less the total assessments, and your net amount is in a very good positive trend. And, uh, you know, we hope to see that continue. Sarah, last, uh, you want to wrap this up, Sarah, or? Okay. Um, well, I mentioned earlier that the, the forecast should be considered a, a, a planning tool and it's not engraved in concrete. Uh, in other words, it's, it's going to change, as I mentioned, as new information comes available. Uh, and as it gets further out into the future, it's, it's certainly less, less accurate. I mentioned city officials should continue to monitor trends and current events that may impact finances. Uh, this is uh, an important factor in, in using the tool to its fullest uh, to be able to run iterations uh, based upon things that may be happening. For example, a big thing that is happening now is the federal government's American Rescue Plan. Uh, early numbers indicate a significant increase in, uh, in allocations uh, across the nation and low, I believe the early estimate is, uh, I hate to throw numbers, but it's in the multi-million dollar range. Uh, as time goes, uh, uh, goes by, there'll be, I'm sure there'll be uh, much more detail on how that money can be expended on what types of costs and for how long how long do you have to spend that. Uh, COVID-19, the pandemic has created additional costs and lost revenues for local governments. Uh, again, uh, depending upon how quickly uh, things get back to normal, there may continue to be a down, downward trend in those re uh, revenue areas that are subject to, to the economy, such as hotel, motel excise, and meals tax, uh, and building permits. Uh, and then the additional cost, uh, as you've probably seen, uh, fortunately, this, the federal government has stepped in to cover many of those costs. And then lastly, uh, the city leadership and, and uh, their finance team uh, will have to closely monitor the temporary or longer term financial consequences of the pandemic on the city, as I mentioned in, in, uh, in previous remarks, but also on its citizens, they, you know, big unknown, especially for central cities is uh, what has happened to, to its citizens? What type of uh, economic impact has it had and how long will that economic impact continue? Um, so th these are uh, may, may be a little bit outside the typical area of revenue expenditure forecasting, but uh, given the, the severe nature of the pandemic, it certainly will play an important role. Thank you, Tony. Um, and thank you, Rick, for um, walking us through the charter assessments. Uh, Connor had asked us to save some time to answer any questions. Um, and so while you all think of your questions, I'll just say one last time that we, we really do appreciate the chance to work with the city. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask us. Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you, everyone from the Collins Center. This was uh, this was an excellent report, and 
We appreciate you working with the city and our team of professionals. We appreciate the kind words. Uh, reinforces what we think we have here, which is a which is a great team. Um, let's go right to. Um, I don't have any questions. I think the similar to the budget document that we get is very thorough, and uh, it does to me um, it addresses a lot of questions that. Uh, we used to spend many, many hours going through uh, budget deliberations, and when you have more information, that's less questions, in my opinion. So uh, with that, I'll go to uh, members of the Finance Subcommittee. Uh, let me also recognize City Council Rita Mercier, who, is, who joined us uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Um, Council Noon, and then Council Conway. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, too, want to echo uh, you in terms of thanking the uh, Collins Center uh, the team uh, for this report is this report is very uh, 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 comprehensive and uh, detailed and looking looking at you know a, a, some of the things that the city have done and you know, also provide suggestions as to what we need to keep our eyes on I think specifically uh, this report seemed to focus um, a lot on the uh, charter school reimbursement as well as the revenue loss uh, which is very significant to the city and, uh, but also hopeful to the city too down the road that uh, that foundation budget will be a, a vehicle that can help us in addressing the, the charter, uh, charter school uh, uh, assessment and, and, and uh, uh, reimbursement. And of course the loss of revenue I think with the, um, the federal um, uh, uh, stimulus uh, certainly Good. is gonna help us quite a bit. So um, that said, I wanna thank the, uh, the team from the Collins Center, Mr. Chairman, um, thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Um, Councilor Conway, um, any questions, yeah. thoughts, on <coughs> your answer? Yeah, uh, just just a quick uh, uh, just a quick comment. No, I don't have any questions, but I would like to say that that uh, was an incredible uh, report by the Collins Center, and uh, I uh, we certainly thank you uh, very much. And it, uh, uh, I think it helps to give us some direction too. So again, great great report, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clerk. I do know that there is um, a registered uh, there is a registered speaker that is uh, has been in the the Zoom waiting. Yeah, he's in he's in the meeting now. Robert Gignac. Mr. Gignac. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I don't have any comments. I think it's uh, it was a, a great presentation. I I just wanted to to thank uh, the CFO, Mr. Baldwin, and uh, his deputy CFO, Ms. Uh, Chambers, for engaging with uh, me and. LTCPS and conversations around this planning. I think it's not only a good tool for the city, but also for us uh, for planning uh, moving forward and, and providing opportunities for little children is, is what we're all here uh, to support. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gignac. Um, could we get your the name and address just for the record? <laughs> sure. Uh, 91 Llewellyn Street, Lowell, Mass. Thank you. Thank you very much. So with that, Council Mercia, um, I know you're here. Nope, no questions from her. It's, um, it's hard to ask questions because this, uh, there's lots of information to throw. I, I certainly appreciate the, um, the explanation on the charter schools, uh, the foundation budget. Um, hopefully at some point in time, the, student, the, the elements of the Student Opportunity Act that were passed will um, come through in a financial sense, uh, but I, I I think the explanation certainly expanded my understanding of, of the process. And um, I'm sorry, pardon me, Madam Manager. Oh, no. Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to um, just briefly chime in that I think planning tools like this are critical looking five years out in, in looking you know, over, over our shoulder where we've been and where we're headed. Um, the schools, as you've mentioned, are such a huge part of our budget and, uh, and critically important. Uh, and at the same time, we have to understand the trend and the direction where, where it's going. So, you know, um, I share your concern. Obviously, we want to have full, um, we, we, we're, we applaud the Student Opportunity Act and more resources coming to our schools. Um, and we would certainly applaud fully uh, funding the charter school reimbursement. Um, I think this year alone we're looking at an increase of four million dollars. Um, it's a huge impact on the city side of the budget. So uh, looking at this year and down the road and I think one last thing and that is 
you know, we know the pandemic has been a, a very big challenge for everybody in terms of the um, budgets and in people's own economies. Um, but we also know that as, as the representatives from the Collins Center have said, this can last for another two or three years, you know, the impact, the financial impact. And so that's why the planning tools are really critical. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this meeting tonight. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you, Madam Manager. So um, I, I concur, and um, I think there was ever a time when the relevance of this study, study and review of revenue forecasting clearly was this year. It couldn't, the timing couldn't have been better with the uncertainty and unpredictability of, of so many things, um, and, and the city administration has done an exceptional, exceptional job, in my opinion, in delivering services. Uh, keeping keeping taxes in check, understanding the impact that COVID has had on on businesses and residential property owners. So, um, this document is going to serve us well, uh, as well as the process. I mean, I think I think Connor will agree. Um, give a shout out to Allison. I know you led this effort um, in large part. So, um, to me, very very a job very well done. And uh, as we go into the budget season very soon. Um, this this information and this forecasting model will be very, very important. So, oh, I'm sorry, Council New. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's also, Mr. Chairman, uh, a, good, uh, a third party, in this case, is Collins Center, uh, and I'll commend uh, the, the good work that our CFO and, and, and his team, Allison uh, Chambers, um, you know, to, uh, the work they've done. And with that said, you know, I hopeful, you know, going forward, it's not easy, but Hopeful that you know our, our finance team will will be on top of this as well. Thank you. Okay, I think that concludes. We'll just um, we'll we'll literally bring this forward for a report of of progress. Um, there is no recommendation. The recommendation is uh, um, it's just a it's just a great document, great tool. So again, thank you to um, to the Collins Center. Um, I don't see the names on Zoom, so I apologize, but it, I know there was Tony, I know there was Sarah. Rick. 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 Oh, here they are. Sarah, Anthony, and Frederick. Rick, thank, thank you very much for your time and, uh, and energy for this report. So anything further? Entertain a motion to adjourn by Council Noon, second by Council Conway. All those, uh, all those in favor signify aye. by saying aye and the opposed. That motion carries. This meeting stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.